We are recording and prohibiting. Today is Wednesday, November 7th. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing Alexander Samaras for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X in Campbell Hall on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. I'd like you to tell us where, your background, where you were before you went into the service and how that came about. Well, I was at Illinois State uh, Normal University, which is now Illinois State. And uh, I was a junior um, in 1941. My first two years, I went to the University of Illinois, and then I transferred to Illinois State Normal. I, after Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> I investigated the possibility of being able to finish college before I went into the service. So I, I contacted the Navy and uh, they said that I can enlist into a V7 program, which would allow <laughs> me to finish my degree and then immediately go into active duty. So I went to St. Louis on, um, I think it was July 7th of 1942 and enlisted. You had then completed your degree? No, Oh, I, I oh, was a I junior. See. Excuse me. I was a junior at the time. So from then on, I got to work on my degree. Uh, I had to, um, we also had a V12 program, uh, which was for enlisted men and um, we had to do all kind of uh, uh, calisthenics and stuff to toughen us up. We ran a mile, we ran a half a mile, quarter mile, calisthenics every day and so forth. A lot of work like that to keep us into shape. Then as soon as I graduated in August, the 1st of September, I headed for Tower Hall in Chicago, which was the midshipman school there. It's what we called, what they called us, 90 Day Wonders. Right. I don't know if you've heard that before, but uh, <clears throat> it's a wonder we made it, really. <laughs> but uh, we went in, in as apprentice seamen. So we wore the little sailor hats, just like enlisted men do, for the first month. And then we graduated to midshipmen. And then the last two months were midshipmen, and then Eventually, we were uh, all on December 22nd. I was commissioned an ensign in the United States Naval Reserve. At the uh, Tower Hall, our daily schedule ran from 6 in the morning till 10 at night. During this time, we were taking classes, studying, doing work. We did that six days a week. And on Sunday, we were given the day off. So as you can see, we were quite busy. And that's how they made us a 90-day wonder, working us uh, that many hours each day. Right. So I um, graduated and received my commission on the 22nd. And on the 26th, I married my wife, Carolyn, oh. of December. And I had to leave until uh, the last of January, I think, and then I had to go to, um, what was the place? Solomon Islands. But this and is not the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. No, no, Solomon Islands, Maryland. Right. Where we did training for LCTs. It was uh, one thing of note that I think was quite interesting. Uh, just before we graduated, uh, they asked the class, uh, each person individually, what duty would you like? Would you like to be in the Air Force? Or would you like to be uh, on a destroyer or a battleship or whatever? And I put down, I'd like to be on a submarine. Well, when we got our orders, everybody was <laughs> amphibious. <laughs> no one got what they wanted. So that was the main reason for the duty of the 90 Day Wonders at that time was to get ready for the invasion. 
So anyway, I went to, Mil to uh, Marilyn Solomon's, and uh, I had the uh, LCT509. And there I started receiving my crew. And, oh, you'd uh, already been assigned to your ship? No, and I hadn't been assigned to my oh. ship yet. Oh. This was the ship that we trained on. I see. And But my crew began coming aboard so that I could work with them also. Uh -huh. okay. See. Then, um, I think in February, um, I went down to um, New Orleans, and there were, I was going to pick up my ship, which was the 709. Well, it hadn't been delivered yet. It was still coming down the Mississippi. So I was assigned to LST 510. Now, the 510 was going to be the ship that carried my LCT on top of it. Oh. And that's how my ship got across the Atlantic. So these are both, the T means tanks, I assume, in yes. both cases, but one's a ship and one's a craft. Right. An I LST see. is over 300 feet long, uh -huh. size of a football field. And uh, the inside of it is probably three stories high. And an LCT is how long? About 107 feet, okay. 35 feet wide. So um, down there in several days, um, well, I had my wife come down and be with me while I was there. Um, my LCT finally came down. And they use huge cranes and lift this LCT up and set it on top of the deck of the LST. Now it's set on wooden things, which are ways that are greased. And then they anchor it down with lines all over it so it, it won't move. But when we want to move it, it'll slide uh, off of the greased thing. Does this mean you had no time to train on the LCT in the Gulf? No. Okay. You no. didn't get on your craft until? No. Okay. I was assigned to the 510. Right. That was, that was my duty. I wasn't even, I guess, legally the skipper yet <laughs> of, of that. Okay. But uh, then we went around to um, New York and they loaded the LST, which is close to 300 feet long, about three stories high, and I would say um, 45 to 50 feet wide, we loaded it with ammunition. We had everything from uh, 30 caliber rifle ammunition to five inch 38 shells. Wow. For, uh, that, that are used on destroyers and, and cruisers. And it was amazing to see because um, there were walkways where you could walk in between them, but it was just solid ammunition. No matter where you looked, <laughs> it was ammunition. Well, we went around um, from New York. <clears throat> we went to Halifax. How large a convoy was it about, approximately? Oh, I would say we had, uh, well, I think we had at least uh, 30 LCT, LSTs, and um, we had several destroyers that were supposed to protect us right. on the way. <laughs> um, but it was, so it was a good sized convoy. Entirely the military ships. This wasn't commercial ships as well. Oh, it's, no. It's just that. Entirely military. And this was the North Atlantic where we crossed, and it was the, the most treacherous uh, body of water. Uh, we were in um, a bad storm um, where the waves, it's almost hard to imagine but the waves were so high, you would come up 
to the top of a wave and you would go down into a gully 75 to 100 feet and come back up to the top of the wave again. Mm -hmm. So part of the time you could see the convoy and part of the time you couldn't. When you came to the top of the wave then you could see the ships around you. Well on uh, I don't remember what, what, what day it was. We had um, an attack by German submarines. And two of our ships um, were lost. Um, they were hit by torpedoes. And, and the, the bad thing about it, there was no way to rescue anybody because the water is so cold in the North Atlantic, that you can't last more than three or four minutes in the water or you're frozen. So they don't even make an effort to pick up survivors. That, that same night, when these two blew up, and I happened to be uh, the junior officer on the con, um, we were hit by a torpedo in our port stern, the back of the yeah. ship on the left side, and it didn't explode. It was a dud. Oh my gosh. And I, I said to God that night, I'm a fatalist, a complete fatalist. <laughs> I'll never too. worry again about what's going to happen to me when I go and so forth, because if that had exploded, I mean, uh, there would just been nothing left of anybody or any parts of the ship. Um, that was quite an experience. <laughs> Everybody any... took a couple of days to kind of let go on that and say, no. Were there any additional days at which you were under Siege by German submarines, or was that the main one? Well, we get we get warnings, yes, but th that was the only two days, uh, the the day that uh, the two were sunk. I see. On it, and it, that was enough. Yeah, that was enough, and of course every convoy that went across was was usually attacked by the German submarines. So uh, that was the purpose of the destroyers and the destroyer escorts to try to keep tabs on them and keep them away from us if possible. Right. Where were, where, what was your um, destination, your first destination when you, after you had crossed the Atlantic? And I think the first place we, we went into uh, North Ireland. And um, after that, we were in Wales for one day and on the 20th of April, we left for Plymouth, England. And on the 22nd of April, the LCT-709 was launched. Huh. Now what they do, they take the ship, the LST, and they list it to the left or to the right, whichever side they want to slide you off on. And the whole ship is listed like this. And then they cut the lines on the, L, on the LCT and it slides right off the deck into the water. What? <laughs> That's quite a fall. Yeah, it was quite a fall. Well, nobody's in it. <laughs> and uh, then they take, take it and tow it to a uh, wharf and then I take over. Finally. It's command, yeah. yeah. I take over in command. Is there a ceremony of some sort? Or no, no so ceremony. Many For the little guys, there's no ceremony. <laughs> Um, then I get uh, I get the rest of my crew gradually coming aboard, and then I had my. Ship, pardon? I'm sorry. Did the rest of your crew ship on the LST as well? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, my executive officer came aboard in England. Uh, he's also an ensign, so we had two officers, and we had 16 men. That was the crew. And you saw, you know, the size of the ship that we're on. 
you want to tell us what the, the armament is? Does it have any guns on it? Yes, we have uh, 50 caliber machine guns. That, that's about the strength of our armament. Okay. <laughs> 50 caliber machine guns, we have two of those. So uh, we weren't really what you'd call a fighting ship. You know, we were pretty much taking in supplies and taking out things that need to go back to ships and <clears throat> and so forth. On the 22nd of May, our radio was set on secret frequency. Could I interrupt for a second? Certainly. Now, at some point, you you now have a chance to train your crew, I assume. Oh, yes, we go out and train it. So yeah, how I'm long a period was that to get that shakedown? Something? Well, it was almost a month. So you did have some time to get them mm -hmm. Familiar with your craft? Oh yeah, we okay. we immediately went out on a on a cruise. Did to, did you think that was enough time to to get them? Oh ready? yes, really, because okay. it's it's pretty simple to operate it. The only thing we didn't really get to do was do any landing. Oh, um, I only made one landing before I went in D Day. Okay. Well, okay. So now you were talking about the radio, at the secret. Um, Yes, on, uh, they were set on sequence frequencies, and everybody was on the same frequency, so that we could be contacted anytime if we needed to be, although there was radio silence. But we had the frequency set. And I had um, two Army officers from the 50th Signal Battalion come aboard to inspect the ship. And on the 26th of May, we took on a full supply of fuel and water and food. Now, how, how much before this were you aware that you were part of the invasion fleet? Was it in May or, or was it earlier than May that you became aware that this was going to be your job? Yeah, pretty much when we got to England. Okay. It was we fairly figured, clear? Yes. Yeah, something big is going to happen. That's why we're here and with all these LCTs that came in, I mean. And now it's late May. When do you hear? Uh, I assume you're going to tell us when you heard exactly where you were going. Okay, um, on the 30th of May, I, I should say, um, was the big top secret meeting about Operation Overlord at Maypool. And this is where I, I got all that, e that information that I was showing you, all of that stuff in a great big box that we had to carry back and try to assimilate in about three or four days. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the things that are in that package that you received at that meeting? We had um, pictures of the complete beach where we we're going to land, uh, air photos of the complete beach. Um, we had uh, pictures uh, of, of the beach and the obstacles that were on the beaches that we had to watch out for. Um, we had timetables for the tides, so we knew when the tides were going in and going out. Um, you had sort of a table of organization of what was going to be on your craft and things like that. Well, I, I received then uh, when the, the 50th Signal Battalion came aboard, and they told me they were going to be on my ship and that they were my ship and the 710 were the two um, ships that were going to carry the 50th Signal Battalion, which is a pretty important. We had to make the beach and we had to deliver these people so that they could go on into France and set up the communication center for Omaha and Utah Beach. Oh which was going to be fairly close to St. Mary Gleese. So it was very important that we knew what we were going to do and knew what we were doing and knew where we were supposed to go. So we did a lot of studying <laughs> to make sure we were in the right place and, and so forth. safely. Um, on the 22nd of May, our radio was set on the secret frequency, and um, on the 31st, May 31st, 
the ship was sealed. No one could leave the ship. No one at all. On June the 2nd, we loaded the 50th Signal Battalion. They loaded them backwards. Our bow was facing the wharf. So they would go, <coughs> put the last one that goes off, would put it on first. And so the last thing to come on was the duck, which was this huge com just communication center. And uh, we could listen uh, while we were waiting to leave. We could listen to New York on their radios. Oh, my gosh. It was, that, it was powerful. Yeah. So the communication was in one of those? In the duck. We had one duck, yeah. Amphibious type vehicle. Yeah, it's right up on the beach. I'm sure uh, you've probably seen them. They still have them in parades and stuff around. Right. But it goes on land and water both, right? So it can't miss. It's not going to, it's going to make it. If nothing else makes it, the duck's going to make it because it's that important. Right. So on June the 3rd, yes. I entered this in my log book. 1940, slipped mooring to meet convoy headed for France. God bless my ship and me. And I need to add something interesting here. At the last briefing at Maypool, and this is something that most people don't know about. I'm really surprised. We were advised that there was a possibility that the Germans might use poison gas. So, we were issued impregnated coveralls and gas masks to wear when we went into the channel. Now, try to picture this. <laughs> I had on my uniform, my impregnated coveralls over my uniform, my sidearm, my life jacket, my helmet, my foul weather gear, and my gas mask. I had so much extra weight that if the ship went down, I would sink like a rock. <laughs> Even with your life vest. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Did you ever take the gas mask off? Or? Yes, I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we left Dartmouth, the weather was terrible. This is it June was, 2nd now? No, this is uh, the 3rd. The 3rd. Mm -hmm. Right? Heavy rains, high winds. And when, when we, we were doing most of the traveling at night, so I had to put two of my men on the bow of the ship so they could see the LCT ahead of us. I mean, we were in just close formation. That's how we, we pretty much followed each other. Right. And, and it was hard to see from my conning tower. I could hardly see the bow of, of my ship. So I had to rely, rely on the two that were on the bow. But I mean, it was, it was terrible. It was, the wind was blowing ferociously and the water just raining hard. I mean, we were soaked, absolutely soaked. Uh, at 0600 on the 4th of June, now we've been traveling all this time because we only go six knots, that's our maximum speed. <clears throat> and during this time, all we could make was three knots. Oh. Three knots, that's like three miles an hour uh, in this driving rain and stuff. Tired. Well, anyway, at uh, 0600 on the 4th of June, we received orders to head back to Weymouth and that DD had been delayed 24 hours and 30 minutes. We arrived in Weymouth and tied up around 1800 where we all laid down and slept where we were completely exhausted. At 0500 on the 5th of June, we were underway once again to France. The rain was very light now, although the seas were still quite heavy. And we were able to make six knots now. Oh. We doubled our speed. Visibility was poor, 
which made it difficult staying on station. That was following each other and ahead of us and keeping on either side of us. We reached our transport rendezvous area off Utah Beach around 2200 on June the 5th and dropped anchor. I sacked out for four hours. Then I took the second watch at 0200 on the 6th of June. As dawn was coming up, it had cleared and the sight that I beheld was one that I'll never forget. And I really mean this, I'll never forget this. It was absolutely awesome. I could hear the planes overhead at 0200. It was loud, almost like a sound of a freight train going. It was just continuous. And you could see them blink V for victory signs, some of them, as they went overhead. <clears throat> well, when dawn came up, I couldn't believe my eyes. Everywhere I looked, from zero degrees to 360 degrees, all I could see were ships, LCTs, LSTs, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, 5,000 ships were out there. If you can picture that, just imagine 5,000 ships and overhead. The sky was almost black with the planes going over. Still, yeah. B-17s, <laughs> all kinds of different planes, some fighters. And again, you could see the blinking mm -hmm. V for victory. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah. <laughs> it was something that I will always remember. I can see why. It, uh, it was something. We were designated on call. Um, which meant we had to wait until the beach area was fairly clear. We, with the signal battalion, they would let us know when they thought it was safe for them to be able to hit the roadway, which we were going to get close to, and drive on into France to their destination. On the way in, we hit a sandbar. We didn't make it all the way to the beach. Sandbar wasn't even listed in our thing. It was supposed to be a clear shot into right. the beach. Well, we hit it, so we were probably, oh, 50 yards or so off the beach. So there was about a foot and a half of water as he got off the ramp. Well, naturally, the duck didn't have any problem at all. But uh, I think we lost about three of the Jeeps that didn't make it in. They just got stuck? They, yeah, they just got stuck. Well, they had they had their exhaust pipes and everything sticking up like this on the side so they could be in water and still run, see? But um, three of them didn't make it, but the the important ones did, the trucks and the, and the ducks, and they made it. Um, so this was approximately what time on the 6th that, that you unloaded? 12.45. It's a little afternoon. The uh, 777 and another LCT were sunk off our port side, and there were several bodies floating around in their life jackets. They were sunk by what? By uh, the uh, obstacles on the beachhead. The mines? And that the were mined, mines. yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there any artillery fire as well? Oh, yes, there were German 88s were still coming in. You could hear those whizz, you know, splashing. Um, as we were getting ready to retract, another LCT came in too close to me. <coughs> and in trying to maneuver out of the way, our cable got fouled around our port screw. Oh. Now this cable, let me explain that to you. We have about, uh, 200 yards 
250 yards of steel cable like this that's hooked to our anchor. So when we make a run to the beach, when we're 150 yards out or so, we'll drop the anchor and then it'll run out as we go in. We use that to help pull us off the beach I see. when we come off the beach. But anyway, that cable got fouled around the port screw. So um, my coxswain and I spent uh, a couple hours using a hacksaw to cut that off. We had to go down underwater and, and cut that off so that we could so we and then when we left the beach, we only had two two engines to run on, because that wasn't it. We fouled up our one engine and lost the anchor. All this time, German 88s were exploding all around us. Another confirmation of my being a fatalist. <laughs> well, we had to go out and do repair, get a get a new anchor and and uh, some more cable. This was back line. in England? Uh, no, no, we go out to a repair ship. Oh, in the channel. I don't get back to England until Christmas time. So everything... I'm sorry, that, I'm getting ahead of your story. Yeah, everything that's done now is on the, on the beachheads. And um, on the second day, um, yeah, on the seventh, um, we were strafed on the beach by two... There were two fighter planes, and I guess that was the last two fighter planes they had. They were just going around down the beaches, strafing, having fun, I guess, because that's that's the last we ever saw of any German aircraft. Kind of a dangerous fun for you. Yeah, it was. But uh, from then on, I worked all five beaches. There was. Juno, Gold, Sword, and Omaha. And wherever they told me to go, I had to go. And I unloaded supplies from ships. I un unloaded trips, uh, troops uh, that were coming in. Uh, um, food, water, ammunition. Vehicles as well? And vehicles, yeah. Vehicles. And and the British were using the American craft to help yes. their beaches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really had much more than what they had. They had LCTs, but they weren't like ours. And uh, not nearly as many. I mean, we overwhelmed them as far as that goes in that number. But we carried prisoners out to ships. Was that uh, dangerous? Were they? No, no, they were pretty well they guarded. They were well under yeah. guard, okay. And, uh, Actually, most of them were pretty glad to be out of it. I see. And um, people that were injured had to go to hospital ships. We took them. Just about anything and everything. And we worked 24 hours a day. Whenever they needed something, they called us. We had to go. It doesn't matter when it is. When did you rest? Well, that's why the executive officer and I took turns, okay. so that he got 12 hours and I got 12 hours of sleep. And we had to do pretty much the same with the crew members. And there were times when uh, we wouldn't have a call for uh, six or eight hours, you know, and we could relax. And once in a while, um, we could get on the beach and just beach and they'll give it, they'd give us a couple of days just to stay on the beach. Okay. And uh, you get on the beach and let the tide go out and then you're on the flat bottom, see our ship's flat bottom, and you just sit there real fine, no problem at all. Was, was this one of the major invasion beaches at the time? Or yes. Mm -hmm. Was there still a lot of evidence of the battle when you were there on the beach? Um, I mean, left over and at the time? Well, on the first couple of days, yeah. yes, but after uh, after the first week or so, no, it was pretty much cleared up. I see. Mm -hmm. So we worked. Um, we had two or three big storms, um, where uh, 
there were tremendous storm. We couldn't, we couldn't stay on the channel. We had to go up a little river uh, and uh, stay in there while the storm ran itself out, right. so to speak. So that was interesting sometime trying to get in there soon enough to get out of the storm. But um, went back to England around Christmas time. So during this six months, the craft held up pretty well? Yeah, well, we had we had repaired engines. Engines would go out and had to put new engines in. And see, we had three diesel engines. So we had we had three screws that pushed the ship. Right. And um, so you burn now, anytime it. you had repair, you had to go out to the repair ship and right. get it done. Was was the craft repaired in the water, or did they lift it out of the water onto no, the? No, most of the time it was repaired right right in the water. I see. Yeah, unless you had a a hole in the bottom or something like that, then you'd have to go and dry dock. We had one one interesting thing. Um, that happened, and that, to this day I still don't understand. But the uh, battleship Rodney, a British battleship, was out uh, out there, and they asked six six of us LCTs. They were having trouble with e boats, uh, mm. German e boats <coughs> that have torpedoes, you know, kind of like our PT boats. Right. And uh, they asked us to protect the battleship, and they wanted us to moor alongside both sides of the ship so that if uh, a torpedo come, it would hit us first. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and so we did it. We did it two nights. And I, I, I talked to some officers afterward. I said, who was the stupid person that figured this out, that we were going to protect the battleship? Because most of the torpedoes go down to about six feet under the water and then hit. In our draft... <laughs> is two feet. <laughs> so if they were going to torpedo, the torpedoes would go under us anyway. You know, they wouldn't even hit us. So they would destroy the battleship and hurt you because... Yeah, they well, it. they'd destroy us too, probably. <laughs> oh, that is ironic. But I thought it was kind of a silly thing, really. So it's now December, and you finally get back to England. Do you get some leave time? At yes, then? get some leave time. And uh, I enjoy myself. I go to the uh, what is it? The Christmas program in England with uh, all the kids and stuff. That oh, uh, yes. the um, oh, what is it? All the silly hijinks and things. What? All the silliness they do. And well, yeah. I mean, they had they have <laughs> they had uh, Christmas programs for the children and stuff. And then they had Christmas programs for the um, just soldiers, sailors, Marines, anybody that came uh, to the Red Cross for uh, entertainment or refreshments and so forth. So I I helped with the Christmas programs. I uh, I played the piano and and helped entertain them while I was there. Spent three months in England before being sent back to the States. Now, while you were there in England, were you still doing the transportation no, across no, the channel? No, or this was just I was finished then. You were on land. I was finished. And um, I stayed in my little ship, which was moored there. And gradually all of the personnel left. My executive officer left and so forth until I was the last one. Oh. And then this is one of the reasons that I got to bring back a lot of this secret material that I was showing you. Uh, every officer has a sea chest, 
where you keep your clothing and everything else and when you move from station to station. And so I packed up my sea chest with my clothes and everything and I got ready to go. And um, I asked one of the officers who was um, checking, I said, what's the, what's the chance of my sea chest going through without being inspected? He said, 50%. You got a 50% chance. So anyway, I thought, well, I'm gonna take it. So I put all this secret material in and put it in my sea chest and that's how I got all this home. Now it's f for posterity and for yes. my children. <clears throat> so what uh, happens to an LCT at that point? Is it mothballed? The LCT is gradually torn apart. Oh my gosh. And uh, I found out years later that they'd put it back together and and uh, some little small country uh, had it and was using it. Uh, oh. But they can take it apart by pieces, you know, that's how it's assembled in in certain sections. So after every time, I mean, I could, I could watch them kind of taking it apart, taking this, taking the bow off and taking this Was that off. somewhat of a sad moment for you? Yeah, kind of. I bet. Kind of, because that was, well, that was a home for... Yes, that had been your first uh, command. Yeah, over six months. Went back home, had 30 days leave and enjoyed my family. And then I was promoted to Lieutenant JG on April 1st, 1945. So you can see that's, what, that's almost 16, 17 months before I got to. On the 25th of April, we left for California for Okinawa. Those are my orders to go to Okinawa the Hawaii. Well, I went through Guam and Saipan. I served as an executive officer on the LCSL-81. Now this is landing craft support, large. We had rockets on ours. We looked like a small destroyer, okay. only we were still flat bottom. We were still amphibious. Hmm. But it could, it was ocean going. Like the LST, it was ocean going, so that part was good anyway. So its support was mainly firepower, not firepower. repairing. Yeah, okay. firepower, right. Um, I served as executive officer. The the commanding officer was a USN cap or captain, uh, lieutenant, which is the next rank up. Right. Um, we called this radar picket duty. That's what they called it. We, all of the ships, uh, our ship, and they had uh, destroyers and cruisers and all different ships, circled the island of Okinawa. And we called it radar picket duty because we were there to protect from kamikazes, and from uh, people coming out from the mainland, trying to come out to the ships and blow them up. In what? In in small. Yeah, in little small so, crafts. Yeah. We called it skunk patrol. At this at this time, what was happening on the island? Were we we had already done the invasion of Okinawa? You'd done the invasion, and you were cleaning up. We were still trying. We were to cleaning up. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that was why it was important to have right. the picket. And this was at the time when the Japanese were having a rough time, things were going bad, and this is when they started using kamikazes. Oh. So this was the radar picket duty part of it because we were on constant duty 24 hours a day as we circled the island. And then we had to protect ourselves when the kamikazes come. And there's nothing more frightening than looking up at an airplane 
coming at you and you can see the man in the cockpit. If you want something to scare you to death, that will do it. He's we were lucky. We were never hit. We, uh, we had several near misses where it made us wobble like this, you know, from the explosion. We splashed five kamikazes, shot them down, and uh, it, it was a duty that was, it was a nervous duty all the time. You never knew. Uh, of course, you usually, you got a little warning before they come that the kamikazes are on their way. But once they were there, they just kept coming and coming. And all you could see were ships or these airplanes diving. No matter where you looked around, these guys were diving on the ships. So how did you guide the aircraft, the anti-aircraft fire under those circumstances? Oh, right? it guides itself. They have the thing where they sit and guide it. But how would they know which of those planes? What? The, how would you know which planes your ship should shoot at as opposed to? The one that's coming at you. <laughs> that's easy. Okay. Yeah, the one that's coming at you. I see. And there would be there would be times when you'd we'd get a couple coming at you, but for the most part, it was just one. Okay. They would they'd signal out one person. Were these land based ships or were they coming off carriers? Do you know? Did you know? I think they were coming from Japan. Oh my gosh, you were that close. Yeah, we were that close to Japan. I see. So, but uh, so how long were you on this picket duty around Okinawa? Okay, I was there. We were there until. The end of August. So and we went to the Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. And we went there to get ready for the invasion of Japan. That was the reason we all moved towards Philippines. We were going to get our orders. And the next thing that was going to happen the next big order that was going to come down was the invasion of Japan and then the atomic bomb hit and we didn't have to go. But I forget how many million they predicted casualties we would have had if we had gone ahead into Japan. Right. So I will I was lucky I got to Japan. But as I went there <coughs> as an occupation force. Oh. <coughs> so uh, we went through a You're still on the same ship? Still on the you know, the eighty one, yeah. We went through a very bad typhoon going up there and uh, that's that's rough going that that kind of weather is rough you have to brace yourself in your bunk and when you do wake up you're just stiff from bracing oh, wow. yourself yeah. otherwise you're they, they just throw you out so after that after being in the service that long your body automatically braced itself even oh, when yeah. you were asleep yeah right. I see. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was interesting. I got to visit uh, different places in Japan and Tokyo. Now, what role did the Navy play in the occupation? Were they patrolling or? Yeah, we patrolled a little. We patrolled uh, on all the seaway around the, the island. Were you also helping do any transportation or? No. None of that, okay. <clears throat> No, it was pretty simple. We just made sure that uh, <clears throat> the sea was secure around the island of Japan. I, I interrupted you. You did get the chance to go on land yourself? Yes, we got to go on land. And um, oh, I saw, we went to Yokosuka, and I saw some of the temples and things, you know, it was very interesting. Um, I got a Samari sword from Japan. 
um, from um, some people that uh, we visited, and I think we had a lunch with them or something, my friend and I, and uh, they were very nice. <laughs> and I saw this sword, and I asked them if I could buy the sword from them. They said, no, they just gave it to me. Oh. And uh, the very first week or so, when we went in, we had to we had to go in and wear our sidearms, and uh, it was kind of rough then, and it was crowded. I mean, you'd go by train, and the trains were packed, people on top of them, and completely full inside. And, and um, for the most part, the people were pretty, pretty nice. Once in a while, you'd run into someone that was still bitter and wanted to fight. You may, you had to maybe straighten them up a little, you know. I understand. But um, by the end of December of '45, I'd accumulated enough points to go home and be discharged. You had to accumulate so many points <coughs> to be able to get your discharge. Right. <coughs> Took me 25 days to come home. By ship. By ship. See, I was halfway around the world. What sort of ship were, were you on? It was a troop ship. Right. And I, I arrived in Los Angeles on the 20th of January, and I received my honorable discharge on February 4th at Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago. Where you st almost where you started. Mm -hmm. That's fitting. Yeah. It's uh, it's an experience that I'm glad I had. I I relish my experience, even though there were many times when I was pretty worried about what might happen. But I look back on it and. Uh, I'm glad. I'm real glad I had the experience of war duty yes. in the Navy. Did you feel you were well enough trained to command the crew? I mean, was there ever a time when no, that you were you were well trained then? No, I actually I was not well trained. I'm sorry, I didn't. The question had. So that no could have been either answer. Yeah. Did they train uh, you well to lead and you felt not? And no, I'd like you to explain no. why that you felt that way. Well, time was the, was the problem. I think time was the problem. And they were, they were doing 90 day wonders. Every 90 days they were doing them in all of our different places in the United States where they were doing these schools for the Navy. And so they bring, bring us in there to train and learn how to operate uh, an LCT and uh, where the engines were and so forth. And like I said, I only beached once right. there. That was all. They just didn't have time. They just had them coming in all continuously, coming in, coming in, and pushing them out. So to be an effective leader, you had to depend on your own yeah. background, your own resources. Yeah, really. I want to go back to that training school, the 90-day school. You come in as an able-bodied seaman. Does that mean that if you flunk out, you go into the Navy as a seaman? Those who, those who wash out of the school? I don't know that anybody washed out in okay. my class. I don't think so. Because um, you had signed yes, up. Yes, I would say if you, you, were if you washed out, you would go in the Navy because you're you're in the Navy. Exactly. I, I, I was in the Navy since 42. That's right. So that put a little pressure on you to yeah. do well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like flunking out of college. <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't have, of course, most of the, well, in fact, I think uh, all, of, all of them were college graduates. Exactly. That was yeah. that program. So, but uh, 
that was hard. They always laughed at us, calling us 90 Day Wonders, you know. But uh, that was rough when you're at books and doing work and learning things from six in the morning till ten at night. And when you go to, when ten at night comes, you don't stay up. I mean, you go right to bed and and you go to sleep right away because you're exhausted. And then on Sundays you could walk around Chicago a little and see some of the sights or family comes up and visits you, you know. But um, the other six days, it was not easy. It was. But I, and it was all good. It was stuff we needed. I understand. For sure. Because you learn how to read navigational books and things. Now, like uh, when we went to Tokyo, uh, I had to set the course. Um, to go to Japan. I mean, I took the ship to Japan because I took settings in the morning, settings in the evening, and I chartered the course all the way. And uh, I had to make up for wind differences right. going this way or that way. And, and um, But I, I got right there on, on time, right on slot. Even going through the typhoon. But you have to learn how to take all the readings right. from the stars, and it was interesting, and I I enjoyed it. I I liked it. That's, uh, I mean, there's some servicemen are bitter about what they had to do, and and uh, the rough time they had to go through, and, and and some of the soldiers they they had it pretty rough. There's no doubt about it. A lot rougher than we did in the navy. But uh, it's something I'm glad happened to me, and uh, I feel I feel good about my service. Do you keep in touch with any of the other members of your crew on the LCS? We used to years ago, but we've gradually lost um, my my best friend. He died in '76, I think it was. So. When you first get out, you you kind of keep track, you know, and then you start having a family and, yeah. and that one <clears throat> child, two child, and uh, your work and the, the business that you're in, it, it, all this takes over, and gradually you almost forget about the war, and then you start remembering it again as you get older. Right. <laughs> I was thinking you you've been so. Uh eloquent about the impact on your life and your feeling about that. I wondered if you'd had a chance to talk with some of the people who went through it with you and see if whether they shared that that feeling. Well, I think uh, my good friend did, yes. He he, he enjoyed it. And uh, it's, it's, it's rough. It's rough at times. I mean, it isn't a picnic. But you look back on it and think, I was lucky to go through that. And, I mean, I've experienced something that a lot of people haven't. We'll never know what it's like. I just well, have no idea. That's one of the reasons we were happy to have a chance to interview you yeah. for this project, to, to find out about these facts and these feelings. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I had a good partner. We will have been married 64 years, the 26th of December, which was four days after I got my commission. Right. <clears throat> and uh, Carolyn's been a godsend to me. And she had to survive a war as well on the home front. And it was rough. It was rough on her. Um, after the invasion, she didn't receive a letter from me until the middle of August. So she had no way of knowing she what had occurred? I, she thought I was dead. 
And I didn't receive a letter from her after the invasion until the middle of July. I think the Navy was a little snafu'd then. I was going to say, did it, was it, were the communications that yeah, it was, cut off? Of course, when I got her, I got 50-some letters, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure she got a bunch, too. But it was rough on her. And, of course, it was rough on all the people that had to stay home. You know, that's, that's the greatest generation. Right. And uh, I think Brokaw really hit the nail on the head because we came together as a nation like no other nation has ever done before. And it, it was rough. It was rough on the people at home. They didn't know what was happening to people like us over there, and they had to work. Every, everything was changed over to military factories, and um, you had gardens where you were taking care of your own produce, and victory gardens, I think they called them. And um, they had a rough time. It was rough. And then it was especially rough, like, when she didn't know exactly what had happened to me. I'm certainly glad nothing did in terms of the worst case. I am too. <clears throat> well, I'd like to thank you very much. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I think that is it.